So I'm going to start with just a, a, a really kind of high level um, overview of what, what data visualization is. Uh, you probably have a pretty rough idea, I would imagine. Uh, it's to some extent self-explanatory. But I want to get a little bit at uh, some of the theory behind it. Uh, why do we create data visualizations? When should you, when should you not create data visualizations? That's always um, uh, a good uh, question to ask. And also, um, what kind of visualizations should you look for? When, which ones should you avoid? Uh, and how to make those sorts of determinations. And then after that uh, sort of overview and lecture type uh, section, I want us to take a look at some data in Microsoft Excel, and I just want to show you a few. Uh, I'm not going to show you everything that Excel can do in terms of making graphs and charts, but I want to show you some of the capabilities that Excel has. It'll, it, it'll get you started. It'll show you the rough, uh, the rough way to approach creating uh, charts and visualizations in Excel. And then uh, we'll jump over to Google Sheets, uh, Google's uh, Excel equivalent, uh, and, and see some of the same uh, see how closely the two mirror each other, but then also some of the small differences uh, that are involved between the two. And then I want to close out just by looking at a couple of more advanced uh, uh, tools that are out there that focus on inter interactivity when it comes to creating visualizations, uh, and that's Tableau and uh, D3.js. Uh, we'll just take a look at a few examples as a way to inspire you, as a way to get you excited about uh, what's possible. So I always like starting by not clicking on my Excel sheet that's off screen. There we go. So uh, I'm going to be talking a lot about Edward Tufte. He's sort of the, uh, the father of modern data visualization, uh, uh, if you ask a lot of people, including me. Uh, so a very simple definition, communicating information through simultaneous presentation of words, numbers, and pictures. Now this is talking about data visualization in a in a static sense, so not in an interactive sense, because with, the, with interactivity, you're not necessarily tied to uh, simultaneity. It means uh, when you think about interactivity, you move your mouse, you click your mouse, and you see different pieces of information. So there's a huge difference between a static or paper uh, visualization and an interactive visualization. But, but for what we're thinking about, we're words, numbers, pictures, gotcha. Here is maybe my favorite uh, visualization of all time. This is uh, Menard's uh, a, a diagram showing uh, Napoleon's army uh, on the, uh, the invasion of Russia back in 1812 to 1813, uh, where this kind of tannish color here, the width of that arrow indicates the size of Napoleon's army, and you can see uh, and, and there's a geographic context here. So over here on the left, this is the west, this is France, and then it moves over all the way to Moscow. And you can see as, uh, as, the, army, as the army moves, you can see that width decrease, which means the army is losing soldiers. Uh, you, as you may know, spoiler alert, it did not go well. The Russian campaign was a huge disaster. And you can see just uh, in, in black, that's after the uh, failed campaign. And you can see over here, this tiny, tiny, tiny little sliver of black is, indicates the size of Napoleon's army when they finally made it back after they uh, uh, suffered uh, uh, not only a military defeat, but also defeat by winter and bad weather and things like that. And I mean, so this is, the epitome, thing, like uh, what that, the, that sentence I just showed you, the simultaneous presentation of words, uh, images, text, figures, this is all of it. I mean, I can't read French, and there's a nice description in French of what's going on here, but I don't have to be able to read it necessarily to be able to tell you what's going on there. That's the power of a good visualization. That's something you don't want to force someone to read a whole treatise about your visualization in order to understand what you're trying to convey. That defeats the purpose of creating a data visualization. What you're doing with the, with the visualization is trying to engage your viewers. You're trying to make them think differently about uh, what they're looking at and thinking about. 
And so this was created in 1869. So this was entirely done by hand, obviously. This was not uh, something created with a computer. And so just uh, a very powerful and, and very famous uh, uh, visualization. So that brings us to the question I mentioned earlier. When is a visual visualization a good idea? And I would say when you have a significant amount of data, that's a good uh, baseline. Now what that means will depend on your discipline and uh, what you're actually looking at. But if you look at, say, this little table I created here, that's not a significant amount of data. Uh, if, there, if you have data that looking at a simple table uh, gets across the import of the data or gets across the uh, general uh, structure uh, or, or feel of the data, then just go with that table. That table is in itself a visualization of your data. Um, so that's uh, not something to uh, dismiss out of hand. If you don't need to make a fancy graph or chart, you don't need to. Just save yourself some time. Go eat something other than banana flavored candy. Just the absolute worst thing is when I'm eating some sort of candy, like color, color coded candy of some sort, and I get a yellow piece thinking that it's going to be lemon and it ends up being banana. And I, I have childhood trauma from uh, that experience. Uh, yeah, so this is not a significant amount of data. This, I would say, is getting close. This is a pretty uh, good example of a significant amount of data. This is a, uh, let's see, yeah, a, a, a Oklahoma tax collection data uh, over time. So this is from a, a time series going back from 1942 all the way up through uh, at least at some point in the 2010s, I believe. So that's a case where you have uh, enough data density uh, that you need to experiment with how you display that data to get it across, particularly if you're thinking about a publication uh, where uh, uh, it's going to be just a small figure in an otherwise uh, massive text. So that's something to weigh as well. So you can take uh, a lot of data like this and with a good visualization, you can convey that information with a, a much uh, uh, with much less uh, text or figures or whatever. Uh, so another important aspect of visualization or another good reason to create a visualization is to highlight a relationship between your data. Like that Excel sheet I just showed you, uh, if you wanted to demonstrate a correlation between uh, two of the columns or fields in that data, unless you had the correlation, uh, the coefficient uh, highlighted in a giant block, uh, you wouldn't, it would be a little difficult. Uh, but something like a, uh, a line chart or a scatter plot, which we'll talk about a little bit uh, about what those actually are later, um, the, uh, uh, these sorts of charts are extremely p uh, powerful when it comes to conveying relationships. Uh, these two examples here are uh, related to smoking. So here you see, um, go, when, you, when you see a trend going from the lower left to the upper right of a graph of a line, that indicates a strong relationship between one and the other, which in this case is cigarette smoke per day and incidence of lung cancer, uh, which we now know uh, is, is well established. But this was, some, this was back in 1994, which um, uh, smoking uh, was still a, a huge problem at that point. And here you can see uh, this, this, uh, these dots on the right show um, the number of cigarettes that were manufactured per capita within that country, and then uh, also a, a lung cancer uh, incidence between a certain age. And what that means is uh, if you see the further to the right you go, that means there were more cigarettes produced per day or uh, per person. And again, you can see the further to the right you go, you go higher up almost without fail uh, in terms of the uh, incidence of lung cancer. Uh, so you can see the US actually has two dots on this chart, and that indicates uh, those, of, those in the US who never smoked versus those who um, 
uh, who, who were smokers. And so you can see just absolutely diametrically opposite. Uh, but then you can, uh, so even all these other dots take it, don't, don't take into consideration if someone is a smoker or a non-smoker. It's just the manufacturing of cigarettes. And so if you live somewhere where they produce a lot of cigarettes, you just have way higher chances of, uh, of uh, in, uh, getting cancer. And that's back in 1977. So that's pretty powerful data. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, about different types of charts that are out there. Let's talk about time series. A time series, I hinted at that when we were talking about tax collection. That's when you have a, a set of figures that cover uh, the, the same statistic, where, where the same statistic or the same figure has been collected uh, over any given amount of time. So it could be done on a yearly basis, daily basis. Uh, in the case of uh, like instrumentation data in the engineering disciplines, it could be every uh, nanosecond or every uh, two seconds or something like that. But basically it's the collecting of the same shape and type of data over time where you're recording it uh, for each of these incidences. Tufty has a really nice, uh, a very poetic way of talking about time series. So you have one dimension. So we think about uh, those charts we looked at with the lung cancer. We have your X dimension and your Y dimension. So we have two dimensions with most visualizations. And I will we'll get into that a little bit more about uh, for the most part, avoiding 3D visualizations because usually they're not necessary and they actually uh, are confusing and wrong, it turns out. Um, but anyway, so if you have, uh, uh, you'll see this a lot uh, where you have time going along the bottom of your graph, marching along the regular rhythm, uh, which, uh, yeah. The, nat the natural ordering of the time scale. The, the, the notion of time is something that most of us can get behind. We agree that 1980 came before 1983 and 1990 came after that and so on and so forth. And that's where you often see line charts. So if you imagine, this is that same tax collection data that, I, uh, that we saw in spreadsheet form earlier. This is that same data only represented as a line graph. So you won't be able, I'm sure you can't read up at the top, but that shows uh, the general sales tax collected in Oklahoma in blue. The individual income tax is orange. Uh, the corporate uh, income tax in gray and the motor vehicle, uh, I think fees and uh, other sorts of uh, revenue collected uh, in yellow. So you can see from 1990 until uh, 2015, uh, the change in uh, uh, tax collection. You can see the effect of the Great Recession very clearly where uh, the sales tax and, but especially the state income tax collected just absolutely plummeted uh, in between 2008, 2010. That's something that if you were looking at, um, most of us uh, were alive then, some of us were maybe even looking for jobs or uh, working our first jobs if you're like me. And so you remember that really well and you remember a lot of people losing their jobs or just absolutely struggling to find a job. And so that's a way where if you look at a time series, a lot of people are gonna have that, these sorts of huge events and things like that in their mind already. So that's where when Tufty's talking about the natural ordering of time and the power it lends to a visualization, that's a good example of that. This is just tax data, like this is not important or this is not huge or, or, or monumental data of, uh, in, in, of any sort, but by looking at that 2010 and right before it and seeing those numbers just fall off a cliff, uh, you're able to infer and your readers, uh, if when you're using time series data, will do a lot of inferring even if you don't want them to. So that's sort of the uh, another side of things is to uh, take care. You always take care with your visualization. Bar charts. We've all seen them. They're very extremely common and more often than not something is common that means be, that, me, that means it's effective except when we get to pie charts in a minute. Uh, but bar charts, 
they are useful for comparing discrete categories. So uh, when we're talking about uh, those line charts, that uh, line charts are, are, let me go back to our tax data here, uh, because time is a continuous thing. So uh, lines are useful for, line charts are really useful for plotting out continuous data. So whether that be time, something like temperature, uh, anything where the, you will always have a value, um, that's really an effective place to use a line chart. You've probably seen some line charts where there'll be a gap of a certain point and it's not, uh, it's oftentimes not, uh, uh, it's not possible to avoid having gaps and that's where uh, you might have a literal gap in your data. So if you have a time series chart, but with, for two years uh, back in, uh, 2002 and and three, you may have missed uh, data collection or the data collected did not match the rest of the data set. You may leave it out. So there are uh, times when a gap in a line chart is acceptable and uh, explainable. But for the most part, when you're talking about, uh, uh, when you're talking about line charts, you want to use continuous data. Bar charts, um, you can, you've probably seen them used to, uh, to convey time series data and they can do that. But uh, generally speaking, if you, if, you can't, if you are working with time series and you do a bar chart, if you think about the way you, you look at that as a viewer, you're probably drawing a little line over the curves of the bars on that bar chart. Mm -hmm. So in, when you think about it, if you're making your user, your viewers add in lines or otherwise uh, change their own visual interpretation of what you're presenting, you're probably, uh, you probably need to change the type of uh, visualization you're creating because you don't want to create more work for your viewers. Generally speaking, make it as easy as possible for folks. You get, you get uh, I don't want to throw an actual number out there, but you don't get a whole lot of time when it comes to someone uh, 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 re uh, reading a, a visualization. Uh, you have to get your point across basically immediately uh, there are only so many nerds out there who will spend a great deal of time uh, trying to decipher what you're getting across. A lot of them are on uh, masters and doctoral committees and things like that, but uh, <laughs> regardless, you should try and uh, uh, get it across quickly. So for example, uh, uh, comparing categories, what, what do I mean by that? You can see uh, this chart on the right has uh, uh, the number of giraffes, orangutans, and monkeys uh, at two different zoos. The San Francisco Zoo is in blue, LA Zoo is in orange. Uh, so you can quickly see San Francisco has the market cornered on giraffes, whereas uh, LA has more orangutans and monkeys. So that's a quick way uh, where if you, even though that's conveying, like this is obviously a canned kind of silly little example, but you think about the amount of data involved uh, with behind this chart, and if you looked at that uh, table, would you quickly be able to ascertain, uh, yeah, San Francisco is loaded up with giraffes. Uh, you might be able to figure it out pretty quickly, but that's a very uh, fast way to take a look and, and see what's going on there. Pie charts. I hinted at this earlier, and honestly, there are, there's, there's never really a great time to use a pie chart. Uh, the problem with, uh, with a pie chart is if you have uh, more than basically two slices of pie, uh, it's gonna be too difficult to read and compare, and so you're better off not using it. And if you only have two or three pieces in your pie, then you're better off just showing that little table I, I, I showed earlier uh, talking about banana candy. Uh, there's really just no great uh, reason uh, to use a pie chart. Um, you can see, like, the, this is an example of showing uh, different, uh, the different parties in the European Parliament. If you wanted to compare these ones to this one or, or anything like that, you, have, you could maybe give a rough sense of this one's bigger than that one or et cetera. But if you imagine taking this and representing it as a bar chart, where you have a single bar per party and then their proportion of uh, the members of European Parliament, you wouldn't have to, again, we're not, you're not doing as much work to make a comparison. 
with a bar chart, you would have a very discrete, very clear, these is, this one's higher than this one, this one's lower than that one, and so on. Uh, looking at little wedges of pi uh, is not the easiest uh, geometric comparison to make. That's, uh, yeah, pie charts are the nickelback of data visualization. That's, uh, this one, this tweet's getting old. No one really makes fun of nickelback anymore. <laughs> Scatter plots. This is, uh, I mentioned this earlier, uh, and we looked at it a little bit when we were talking about uh, lung cancer and smoking and, and the, the correlations. It really, uh, when it comes to doing bivariate comparison, scatter plot is a incredibly useful graph, incredibly simple, but it is, uh, when you're looking at, especially when you're doing uh, what we call exploratory data analysis, when you're just trying, when you're looking at that data set that you just collected or that you just got sent by your advisor or by your colleague uh, and you want to see what are the patterns in the data? How are things relate? Are there any relationships? Uh, that's uh, where uh, creating a bunch of scatter plots could really serve you well. And this is a, a little uh, showing what uh, different scatter plots indicate. I mentioned lower left to upper right. That's a strong positive correlation. And then uh, pretty much the more bunched up and just circular looking the distribution of uh, points on your scatter plot are, that means there's less of a connection uh, or there's less of a correlation uh, between them. So you see if you get a scatter plot and it just looks like someone, uh, I don't know, threw a bunch of darts at a dartboard, uh, that, uh, that, that, that indicates there's not really a correlation. Um, a negative correlation means that like the more of one thing you have, the less of this other thing. So that is equally, it, even though it's negative, that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It just means that you've discovered another pattern, uh, which is usually a good thing. Um, uh, it usually leads to asking new research questions. Uh, but yeah, upper, going higher to lower on a scatter plot indicates a negative correlation. And then you see a curvilinear relationship. That's where you have basically a, a, a a distribution uh, where uh, at the ends you have a higher uh, correlation and then it dips in the middle, which honestly I haven't seen too many of those. Does, that, does anyone know any good examples of a curvilinear relationship off the top of your heads? Okay. If you think of one, shout it out. Um, and if you have questions as we're going, as I'm, as I'm blabbing on up here, uh, feel free to ask. Um, just for purposes of the recording we're making, I'll repeat what you ask. So don't, uh, I don't know, act surprised when I repeat your question back to you before I answer it. Uh, but feel free at any point. Okay, so here is a really interesting uh, scatter plot. Uh, this is showing uh, for the top 50 metro areas in the US, uh, the percentage of the labor force involved in manufacturing. And this is uh, comparing um, time series data. So this, the, uh, the x-axis here shows the manufacturing share in 1980, and then the y-axis shows the uh, manufacturing share in decades after 1980. So what this means is, so you see this dotted line going from perfectly zero, zero all the way perfectly up there. That, uh, that perfectly diagonal line indicates that there was no change from 1980 to uh, in, to later decades. So where uh, in 1980, 10% of the labor force was involved in manufacturing, uh, if it was perfectly correlated, you would have the exact same 10% involved in manufacturing. So basically, you look at this and you see that all but, I think, one dot is below that line. That means that for every, all of 49 of the 50 largest metro areas uh, saw a decline in the manufacturing as a share of uh, their labor force. So you can see the highest ones over here. So for example, this one here was, was about 35% involved in manufacturing in 1980. And then you look over here and it's about 12% uh, in uh, decades later. So that might be something like Detroit uh, or uh, you think of uh, places in the Rust Belt, you think of Buffalo, New York, uh, Pittsburgh, and the like. 
But so this is a, a, this is a little more complicated. It takes a little more, but once you get that sense, and you can see also they incorporate these additional lines showing what the, uh, the trend was uh, over later decades. And you can see 1990, 2000, 2011, you can see that share of manufacturing in the labor force continued to shrink um, as uh, I think um, we've heard a lot of talk about lately. So that's a good one. Uh, something uh, uh, that has a little more specialized use versus a scatter plot is a, uh, an area chart. So a 100% uh, area chart in particular. And this is really useful when you have uh, uh, comp uh, when you want to compare values that make up a whole. So basically if you have two or three, but usually you want to keep it to two or three values that will add up to 100% of something, uh, and you can compare those values over time or uh, over just plotting across some sort of uh, additional variable. So this is, it's really useful for looking at election results, particularly in a place like the US where we have basically the two parties. You can see uh, where the share of one, when it goes up, it, the other goes down. And that's a quick way to, uh, to demonstrate um, how uh, something changes. Again, this is something that you could get across with a line chart uh, uh, with not, without too much trouble, but there is something to be said where uh, getting the, the, the fact that you have a whole, you have 100%, and then that the, the fact the cha that there's a change in a, uh, a uh, evolution of those uh, relationships over time. Stack bar chart, uh, this is, uh, you've seen uh, something like this, chances are probably in a newspaper. Um, it's great for uh, just seeing, um, well, for example, survey results in this, in this chance where you have a legend that's correlating to like, how often do you do this thing? And it's often, sometimes, rarely, never. Uh, you can see, you can very quickly see, well, the one with the highest uh, uh, rate of often is uh, classroom instruction when it comes to uh, learning modalities. And then you can see what's the one with the highest level of never, and that is learning games. So we don't play games when we teach, apparently. Um, it can be uh, tricky to assess, the, to compare those inside category, like so, so the ones in the middle there, if you wanted to compare those uh, from one to the other, that can be kind of tricky because you basically have to take that size and move it over. Uh, the cheat or the workaround for that is usually just labeling that little bar with the value of it, um, and that's fine. But uh, if you, it's, the, it's the case where if you want someone to be able to compare easily from one to the other, you might consider either an additional visualization or breaking this up into a couple different uh, approaches. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so this is just, this is not a visualization. Well, it is a visualization itself. It's basically a flow chart, but the, it's, it's a flow chart with a purpose where uh, you start in the middle and you uh, answer some questions uh, about your data, what you're trying to show, and it'll suggest a uh, type of visualization you might go with. So for example, if you say, what would you like to show? Oh, I want to show a relationship. Do you have two variables? Then use a scatter chart. Uh, I want to show distribution, and I only have, uh, I have one variable with many data points. It'll tell you to use a histogram. Uh, so that's a useful thing, and I'll, uh, we'll share the slides with everyone afterwards, so, uh, and I have a link to where this comes from. Uh, so you can check it out and see uh, uh, what's there, but it's a it's a handy thing uh, when you're thinking. Well, uh, I'm not sure what uh, what kind of a visualization would be most appropriate for this, um, and we'll see. Excel and uh, Google Sheets actually do some suggesting for you in terms of uh, visualizations that are possible, but because they're computers. They're not the best suggestions in the world. All, all they are doing are looking at the values and seeing if it will produce a result of some sort. You have to still be the one making that intellectual choice or decision. Does this make sense to create this uh, visualization and share it? Okay, chart junk. Uh, that's basically uh, 
this is this is getting into the me uh, complaining and uh, nitpicking uh, visualizations as they exist. Uh, you you don't need to add a bunch of stuff to your chart to make it look like you did more work. It's totally fine to have a single color for your chart and to have very few lines. Um, you don't like there's there's a definite overall trend in data visualization to make things very minimalist and, and sleek looking and that's not necessarily what I'm arguing for but again a 3D this is what I'm when I'm going to complain about 3D visualization something like a 3D pie chart takes something that's already basically not very useful the pie chart and it makes it deceptive because when you look at uh, something like a 3D pie chart the pie chart itself, it's still put together in such a way that the, su the size of the pie is just based on two dimensions. But now we're looking at this giant band of red here, and that makes it seem like the S and D party is just absolutely dominating when it's not quite that. And so, you, and you see there's these gradient colors where it's fading and it's, and it's showing some perspective. It's just not necessary. Don't do it. Same thing with bar charts and uh, adding in a bunch of uh, minor uh, axis lines. There you see those black vertical lines. It can be helpful to have a few as a guide, but you don't need that many. Yeah, I, I'll repeat it again. No 3D. Same, same data, much cleaner. This doesn't look quite as fancy. Uh, in a way, making 3D charts is similar to uh, uh, when I was coming up and there was this thing called word art in uh, Microsoft Word where you could add just, I don't know, now it looks totally hilarious, the, the sort of text and, and graphics, and it's sort of come back in as, a, as an ironic thing to use, uh, but I definitely used word art for every like report I did in fifth grade. <laughs> don't do it, don't do it. Avoid, avoid the noid. Um, now this is a really, I spent so much time figuring out, trying to figure out what this particular graphic was trying to get across. And this, as you can see, is from a, um, from a uh, newspaper. So this was printed in a newspaper. And this is talking about, uh, let's see, up there at the top. Nearly 90% of the wind capacity brought online in 2016 was in states that voted for Donald Trump. Wherein you see here, the size of these dots represents the amount of uh, wind power uh, generation for that particular state. So that, I mean, that makes sense, that's fine. There, uh, that's, uh, I come from cartography and we use proportional symbols to indicate the amount of an attribute all the time. But you see these two axes, we have the percentage of vote won by Clinton, percentage of vote won by Trump. And you may uh, recall uh, uh, talking about negative uh, correlations. This is suggesting, shockingly, that there's a strong inverse relationship between the percentage won by one candidate versus the percentage of the vote won by another candidate. So for some reason, these dots are being uh, ar arranged along a nexus of how strongly they voted for uh, either Trump or Clinton. And the fact that they're colored, I mean, it's basically where does it pass the 50% mark? So it's, it's just, I don't know what is trying to be done there. Uh, it's very confusing to me. If you wanted to compare capacity, just show the size and the color, leave out the goofy uh, axes. Okay, I'm done with my uh, hectoring, lecturing, whatever you want to call it. Uh, side of things. I think we should start uh, making a few graphs now, uh, if that sounds good to everybody. So I want you to download uh, an Excel spreadsheet. We'll start. Yes? So before we start uh, making graphs, can I have a couple of comments? Because I think you have lost me here. Sure. Um, so many times, like, you know, I mean, in this uh, day and age, it becomes imperative to have colored graphs. Right? So like when you put red, green, whatever, like you know, make it look fancier. Um, like when you do that, there are two things that like you know uh, people might want to uh, think of. One 
morning, like you know, somebody who is color blind may not really get the colors that they're trying to, uh, you know, the kid. The other thing is, you know, some people like me are so old school. Like you know, when I'm reviewing papers, I like to print out, and I may not have access to color printing all the time. So you might want to, like you know, say when you print out, it will it will look all gray, right? Yep. So have symbols. So that we can distinguish when we print out black and white. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just summarize your comments for the recording, but those are two very good points. One is, uh, I, even in, in, in the simple examples I've shown, there's a, there's a large amount of color. Uh, and something to, be, uh, uh, to try to be thoughtful about and to consider when you're designing a visualization that's uh, utilizing color uh, is to uh, keep in mind that there are a lot of uh, people out there with uh, different forms of color blindness. Uh, it's a, a, a very high percentage of, uh, particularly the male population, it's very strongly uh, genetic uh, when it comes to the male population to have, I think, red-green color blindness is the most common form. Uh, uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Red and green, great for Christmas. But when it comes to uh, creating a visualization, they are actually not the best uh, uh, pair to uh, use. I will say there's a, a website out there called Col Color Brewer, uh, which was created by a cartographer originally, and it's a way to generate uh, color palettes. And one of the options is to restrict your uh, color palette choices to uh, those that are colorblind safe. And that, and it can be. It's extremely useful. It's free to use. It's online, and uh, it, it's 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 from the mapping world again. But it's something that's sort of uh, expanded into use by the data visualization community more broadly. Uh, as you realize, um, uh, designing uh, graphics that are usable by your entire readership uh, and being making them universally accessible is incredibly important. Uh, and your other comment was about uh, uh, the fact that oftentimes uh, your uh, visual visualization may be printed out uh, and it may be printed out in not color. So it's important to uh, consider how uh, either in incorporating symbols so that if, uh, the co if, if something's not printed in color so that you have, uh, so that your readers will still have a way of discerning uh, difference between them. Or it might just be that you uh, choose colors and you just test it out printing in black and white and see is there enough contrast uh, when you transfer from one to the other. And that's something in like a, 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 the Adobe suite of uh, software that really gives you a lot of tools for uh, testing out and seeing what your graphic will look like uh, when you're when under different conditions. And especially for like journal articles, there are oftentimes I think people uh, will submit uh, something to a journal uh, and you, you, you create this nice color graphic and you include it and either you didn't read it when you noticed or they didn't mention it or they did it without mention telling you is that they will convert it to black and white and then you see it in its final form and you're like, oh, nuts uh, because your black and white, the black and white version of your graphic has not, uh, doesn't quite work. We've probably all read some sort of uh, journal article or an academic book where there's a graphic in there and you're like and you can't decipher it because it is in black and white so we always want to avoid that and keep it in mind so th those are two very good comments thank you for that uh, are there any other questions or comments before we dig into uh, go ahead yeah, kind of related to that uh, you don't see it much anymore but Excel has all of these types of cross hatching and dots and everything that you can show things in with that's also confusing so I guess <laughs> When you do want to represent that third factor, do you have any suggestions for how to do that aside from color or shading? So like a third variable? Yeah, the third variable. Okay, yeah. Uh, well, for example, um, when you have a scatter plot and you want to add in a third uh, measure there, that's when you'll, uh, you can use something called the bubble chart. And that's basically like the, like the, the the, the crappy wind thing that we looked at, that's an example of a bubble chart. Not a good example of one, but the fact that you uh, increase, decrease the size of each dot responding to a third variable uh, lets you uh, put that in the mix. And that can be very effective. Uh, but then when you get into um, 
uh, symbols uh, and, and then and also cross hatching and things like this. And that, again, this is uh, as my background as a cartographer, when you're trying to say, uh, show the different language groups of something like uh, say the country of India, where there are hundreds of languages and to attempt to convey that in a single map with uh, unique symbols to indicate each uh, language group, uh, it's, it's more or less impossible. So that's where you say, okay, I can't do it all in one. I'm gonna break it up into a series of smaller visualizations. And that's usually the best answer to anything. When you reach a certain point of complexity, uh, you're better off making four versions of that same graphic that are a quarter the size, but less than a quarter of the data. And that is a, a, a common solution to the problem of how do I deal with all this? Okay. No, I, I won't be referencing any more Tufty. Uh, I don't think I do. Okay. Hang on, let's see. Kind of the same old working experience. So if you want to learn the rules for field visualization, Tufty pulls it up. I just put Tufty 2001. I didn't, and I don't actually have a bibliography in the, at the back. Uh, I'll add something um, uh, when we send this thing out. Uh, I actually have the copy in the library checked out currently at my desk. So if you want to come see it, you can. Uh, <laughs> But I think I think we have multiple copies. You can you can find it somewhere. Yeah, it's all over the place. It's a really great book. He's a, a really it's it's filled with just amazing visualizations first off, but also his writing is very it'll make you want to create visualizations. It'll get you excited about it. And that's always fun. I am just flying okay. So anyway, <coughs> is there anything else before we move on? Okay. Uh has everyone downloaded the data from this link here? Okay, hopefully you have it all opened up and I'm going to hop out a full screen, drag it over here. So this is a, a set of data from a, uh, the, uh, a study uh, conducted among uh, the Pima Indians uh, of the American Southwest. Um, what I want to show you uh, is a few things just to show quickly how to create something. So I wanna show you, for example, how do I create a histogram? And a histogram is taking a single variable, so your one, uh, one column of your data and showing how it's distributed. So uh, if you have a statistics background, you know like there's the idea of the normal distribution where you have on either end the, the lowest amounts and then you have the, uh, the, the, the nice meaty middle where the majority of the distribution occurs. Um, and some people apply that to things they shouldn't, but I won't get into that. So for example, uh, to create a histogram, let's go ahead and click on, and just as a general, before we click and do anything in Excel, when you're highlighting data that you wanna create a chart for, you more often than not will not include the, uh, the header. So the name of the column, you will not include it in your selection, because that will uh, that will screw things up. It turns out, so avoid that temptation. So I'm gonna I'm gonna create a histogram of BMI, body mass index. So I'll click on F2, and then I'll scroll down. Well, what I'll do, if you just hold, when you have it selected, just hold Shift and then the Control button and then arrow down. You should see the whole thing get selected. There are like 20 ways to select things in Excel. Um, so do whatever you want, but that, I like to do the control shift method. Uh, so once you have it selected, it should look like it's in gray there. Uh, if you go to the insert menu up here at the top, click insert, and then right here in the middle, click that button where it says uh, insert uh, statistics chart. And then there's histogram, and just click that. And there you'll see, um, by default, like that's, that's not a bad looking thing. That shows, uh, other than a few cases where you see there's a zero measure for BMI, so that's something you would probably want to exclude, uh, and that's something you can do with filtering. So actually, let's do that real quick. 
I'll come back to you, Chart. Uh, control. Oh, I that. Yep, so hold shift and control. Yes, sorry. So you can see, um, so if you use something like filtering, mm -hmm. you can exclude. So what I'll do is I'll click on BMI here at the top, so uh, F1. Then I'll go over here in the upper right where it says sort and filter and I'll click filter. Mm -hmm. That'll create a little, bunch of drop downs on our BMI, uh, on, on each of our, our cells, but I'll click BMI, and there you see the value zero, so I'll just uncheck the checkbox next to zero and click OK. And then if I scroll down to where my graph is, you'll see that uh, it's eliminated that weird looking outlier. And that's something that uh, is very useful when, you're, when it comes to creating a histogram. If you uh, look at your data, uh, you might not realize that there are a bunch of zeros or no datas or other things or negative 99999, uh, which is supposed to indicate that there's no data, but um, that's the kind of stuff that can throw off your calculations when it comes to uh, uh, performing your work. And that's something that uh, creating a quick histogram can help you avoid. So you can see here by default, let me blow it up. You see uh, that it's not that it's showing ranges. So you can see each of these bars represents uh, by default, it looks like uh, 2.8 is the bin. So a histogram divides up all of your data points into different bins. Uh, and Excel lets you edit that, the, that bin size. And the way to do that is to right click on the horizontal axis. So here you see, so I'll just click somewhere on here. <coughs> and then you'll see down at the bottom it says format axis. You can click that. And here you see it says uh, bins and you can do it by category. It's set to automatic, but you can set bin width, and you can make it four, you can make it six, 10, one. And that, uh, when it comes to putting a histogram together, the size of the bin is hugely critical. Uh, so it's, it's kind of important to actually go through and kind of play with the size of your bins, because that will <coughs> oftentimes tell uh, different stories. So you can see um, there are a number of formatting options down here. I'm not going to dig into all of these, but by formatting access, uh, you can basically right click on any part of this graph and format it. So if you want to change the color, you can right click on the, the bars themselves, go to fill, uh, pick a hideous yellow or something, and that's a way uh, to do that. There's 3D format, don't touch it. <laughs> don't be tempted. You can set a fill, you can set a gradient. Again, don't get, here's what Clark was talking about with the cross hatching and just, there, you, you don't need it. If you, uh, so uh, if you, are trying to change the bid width and it's not changing, uh, the biggest thing is to, you'll want to click off of it for it to take effect. So if you, what that means is just basically, uh, or click the button. Mm -hmm. What I usually do, and I didn't tell you guys, is hit the tab key. Yeah. So if you, if you change it and then hit tab, mm -hmm. it'll uh, update it. So thank you for that. You. So that's pretty exciting, huh? It's a histogram. That's just a single uh, variable uh, but that's something where you could imagine taking, a, make, creating a series. So for each column of data, or at least each column of numeric data you have, you might consider creating a histogram, and then you'll have a quick uh, a reference for what's the distribution of my data like? What's it look like? Uh, what's going on there? Okay, let me zoom out, move this thing over. And here you can change your title, so you probably want to change that. So you can double click it. Oh, it's not in a good spot. To 
histogram of BMI. And then, uh, yeah, that's enough for that one. Now the next thing I want to show you uh, is how do you make a scatter plot with, uh, with Excel. So we've talked about it a number of times. So for, uh, for what I want to do, uh, I, I think using BMI and the column called trifold thick, uh, which if you look at the second sheet of the uh, worksheet, it has some metadata explaining uh, what those uh, fields actually mean. We're not going to sweat it too much. Uh, so to create, uh, so I'll show you to, to select uh, multiple columns, the easiest way is to actually move columns so that they're next to each other so that you can easily select it. So what I'll actually do is right click on the BMI column and then uh, left click where it says cut. And then I'm going to right click on the column right next to the trifold thick column and click insert cut cells. Yeah. Oh, because my filter's on. You saw an error there, and that's because I have a filter, so I, I, I tried to cut. Uh, it was trying to skip the filtered rows, so it was uh, yelling at me for doing that. So what I did was click on the little filter arrow and click clear filter. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So now, right click, BMI, copy, right click, paste, and there you should see it, it's moved BMI right next to trifold thick, so that's cool. So now what I'm going to do is select all, both of those columns of data. So I've clicked on uh, trifold thick, the first cell under that, and then I'm going to hold shift and uh, hit the right arrow so that now it's highlighted uh, the first value in BMI. Now I'm going to hold the control button and shift and hit down. And now we've selected both of those columns of data. All right. So now what we want to do next is just like we did with the histogram, click insert. And over here under charts, we'll pick the one right below where we picked histogram. And we'll click insert scatter. And you'll see we'll just pick the first option, which is just a vanilla scatter plot. So click that. And there you see uh, there's our scatter plot. And this is something that you would probably want to make some uh, 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 changes to. So one thing you can see right off the bat is all of those zero values. So you'll probably want to do some filtering again and remove those because that will change the structure of your uh, plot. If you want to add a trend line, so you'll recall back uh, the manufacturing share of the labor force uh, chart that I showed ahead, the, those series of trend lines. Uh, you can add a trend line really easily in Excel if you click this green plus uh, button in the top right of your chart. And down at the bottom is trend line. Click that. And it's funny, it's not the most uh, useful thing because by default it's the same color as our scatter plot. So how do we change that? So if you just click on the trend line itself, just left click on it, you'll see uh, it'll pull up some options here and you can select where it says color and make it something like red or orange. So you see we made it red. And so that shows that you have, uh, it's not exactly a flat line, so it's not a, a, an absolute lack of correlation. It's slightly moving from the lower left to the upper right. So there's a, there's a hint of a correlation between these two values. So that's, that's something. And there you can see you can edit. Uh, you can, can make your trend line really big. Uh, you can make it, you can do all sorts of things to it. Uh, <coughs> I, I just want to expose you to what you can do with Excel if you want to dig into how you can change every tiny little formatting thing, uh, you feel free to do that. Is everyone with me so far? Okay, excellent. Okay, I want to pivot 
to uh, talking about one of my favorite features of Excel, just in general, so even apart from uh, charting, and that's called pivot tables. Uh, has anyone made a pivot table in here? No, no, you got, we got one pivoter back there? All right, cool. So uh, a pivot table is a way to really, really quickly kind of slice and dice your data and, and, and get uh, different views of it. And then at the same time, take that, uh, that sliced and diced data and create some charts of that data. Uh, so let's, uh, <clears throat> what I want you to do is click insert, our old friend, up at the top, and the very first button you'll see there is called pivot table. So click that. It says select a table or range. If like me, uh, you had nothing selected, it should automatically select the entirety of your table. And in this case, you do wanna make sure it includes the uh, column names because that's a pretty critical part of creating a pivot table. So if it doesn't look like mine, what you can do is just hit Control A and it'll expand your selection to the entirety of the table. So make sure you just see this dotted green line dancing around the edge of all of your data. And once you've done that, uh, you, uh, uh, by default it places the pivot table in its, in its own worksheet and that's good. Uh, so we'll say okay. <coughs> Excuse me. And once you've created your pivot table, it should look something like this. Is everybody with me as far as that all goes? Okay, great. And so let me close this format shape thing here. So pivot tables let you group your data, let you create bins for your data, and let you uh, compare one column against another really quickly uh, and then uh, and, and do filtering uh, in really interesting ways. And the way you do that is over here on the right side of my screen, you see it says pivot table fields. It, it'll show you all of the fields uh, in your table. And what you do is drag them to one of these four boxes down here. So it says filters, columns, rows, values. And it's way easier to just do it and uh, see what it does. Because that, for me, that's how I got any idea of what was going on with pivot tables. But what I want you to do is uh, find the column called diabetes down at the bottom. And I want you to click and drag that to where it says to columns. So click and drag it, let it go. And you should see something like this where it says column labels and then it says healthy, sick, grand total. We good? From there, I want you to take BMI and drag that to where it says rows. So BMI, rows. So now you see it's taken the values of the diabetes column, which basically that diabetes column indicates if the person had diabetes or not. By uh, healthy means no diabetes, sick means diabetes. Um, and then uh, by dragging uh, BMI down to rows, it's, it's taken every single possible value of BMI and added the row for it. But now it's still totally empty in the middle because we haven't added anything to the values column. So what I basically, uh, <coughs> what I want you to do is to take diabetes again and this time drag it to values and drop it. So what this has done is taken, uh, it, and you'll see when you dropped it in values, it doesn't just say diabetes anymore, it says count of diabetes. So now what that means is the number of rows, the count of the number of rows within, uh, with that field, that match. So what that means is now for someone, uh, what we have on our table is, let's see, for everyone with a BMI value of 19.1, um, how many have, uh, how many are healthy, how many don't have diabetes, and how many do. And in this case, there's only one person with that BMI, and they're healthy, so there you go. 
So by itself, this is not super useful, right? Uh, it doesn't look great. Um, what I think we want to do is take those BMI values and group them. So uh, look at any of these row labels here. So I'll just click where it says 19.1. You can click on any of the other values. <coughs> and go down to where it says group. Click that. And here you can see uh, where you want your grouping to start. So I want to just leave out uh, the grouping uh, for zero. I want to ignore it. So I'll just change where it says starting at to one. And I'll leave ending at uh, we'll leave ending at just how it is. And we'll break up our, um, you'll remember when we created the histogram of BMI, it chose a bin size of 2.8 by default, and that looked pretty good, so I'm gonna actually go with that. So <coughs> next to where it says buy, go ahead and change that to 2.8 and click OK. <coughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, basically, so now what you have here is a set of uh, groups of BMI values and then the values, the total values for uh, how many people have diabetes or don't for each of those values. So you can see uh, there's a total of 500 people who didn't have diabetes in the study, 268 who did have it, <coughs> and then you can see the total, uh, the total membership of each of those uh, BMI groups. So, that's, uh, so this is a lot of information just packed into this little uh, uh, table here. And so what you can actually do, uh, so there's a lot more you can do with pivot tables. I'm not going to cover it all. But what I want you to do is create a pivot chart using uh, what we've created with our table here. <coughs> so I want you to click on insert and then find over here on the right under charts where it says pivot chart. Click pivot chart. If you have to click it again, click it again. Uh, click on column and it'll uh, default to clustered column. That's what we want, click OK. So what we have here is uh, a breakdown showing uh, people without diabetes represented in blue, people with diabetes represented in orange, and then uh, grouped by uh, the different BMI values. And so there you can see the distribution of healthy people versus sick people uh, you can you can you can see there's a suggestion that basically <coughs> amongst this study group the higher uh, BMI value so you can see there basically uh, there's a, a shift there um, but you can basically conjecture and I'm, and honestly it's not the case with this data uh, that a higher BMI causes a higher rate of diabetes uh, it's not really borne out by the rest of the data, but you see there's some level of correlation there, at least implied. But that, um, and so that is a chart built, so it's basically as if we created an entirely new spreadsheet. If you wanted to create this thing using uh, just our original data set, you would have had to do a lot more uh, uh, messing around. So pivot tables let you leave your original data table untouched and, uh, uh, and, and slice, dice, and create fun new charts uh, uh, without uh, <coughs> destroying. Thank you very much. You would have thought I would recover. I had flu for like two weeks. And I've, been, I've been back for a while, but apparently I've, I haven't used my voice that much since I've been back. But thank you, Kay. Uh, OK. Any questions about Excel, pivot tables, anything before we jump into Google Sheets for uh, a little bit? Do you see uh, Excel hides a lot of functionality, which is what makes it the thing that 99% of people have used, but there's a whole lot there, so it's worth digging into uh, and playing with. Okay, for our next <coughs> section, uh, I want you to uh, go to this link, which is the same one with a two added to it. So when you go to that link, it'll take you to a Google spreadsheet. Okay. 
Uh, so once you have it, I want you to go to File and then click Make a Copy. Because the way it is, you won't be able to mess around with this spreadsheet because we would just have chaos because we would have 20 people working on the same spreadsheet. Should have mentioned that you'll, you'll need to sign in to Google, to your Google account. Uh, if you don't have a Google account, if you just want to join someone else, if you don't want to make a Google account, I don't want to force anyone. But I know pretty much almost every OSU student has a Google account, that, so you can just log in using your OSU uh, email and, and log in. Uh, but you'll log in over there. So once you've logged in, you should be able to click File and make a copy. Um, so what uh, we want to quickly do is, uh, so first of all, I want to show you just that more for the basic charts and things like that, uh, Google is very similar in, in, in the way it works. So again, if we click our friend BMI, <coughs> excuse me, let me zoom in a bit. So I'll click BMI, uh, so uh, F2, hold shift and control again. Go down so that it's all selected. Once it's all selected, click insert. This should seem fairly familiar. And then click chart. Oh, and the nice thing is that Google will um, take some uh, poetic license when you, when you try to insert a chart. So it's by, by the fact that we just selected that single column and it's a numeric column, it says, oh, I think you might want a histogram. So it created a histogram, set the title to histogram of BMI. That's pretty handy, but more or less the same exact thing that we did with Excel. So that's cool. Uh, and if you do the same thing we did for the scatter plot with selecting those two values, the two columns, it'll assume you want a scatter plot and, and, and do that for you. So that's same, same difference, more or less. The biggest difference between the two is that you, uh, you don't quite have the fine-grained formatting control with Google Sheets that you have with Excel. Uh, but uh, as you may have seen, there are so many options in Excel that you don't need all of them more often than not. Um, so again, it, it's you're not you can use either of these. It depends what uh, environment you are comfortable working in or what you need it for. If you want to share it online, Google might be the easiest way to go. Um, Sorry. Oh, yeah, if you want to move your chart around, that's a good question. What I like to do, because it is very annoying to try to drag it up hundreds of rows, with it selected, so you see I have it uh, selected in uh, the blue lines there, cut it, so control X. <coughs> and then go up to the top or wherever you want to put it, and then control V to paste it, and that'll move it without trying to drag it and slowly waiting for it to scroll. So that's a, that's a good question. <clears throat> the, 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 the most interesting part of Google Sheets and how it differs from Excel, I think, is the Explore button. And that's in the bottom right of your screen. So you should see right down there, little green graphic that says Explore. So go ahead and click that. And you'll, if you go through there, Using the power of Google, you can actually just type in a question there. So you could say, um, yeah, list the unique values in diabetes, things like that. Just show, uh, you can explore your data almost conversationally with Google. But if you scroll down, you'll see it gives you a number of options based on uh, what, it's, what it can see in your data. So you can say, ooh, there's a, there's a nice looking pie chart. And honestly, that's almost an, a decent use of a pie chart. I still wouldn't use it, but it's something. There you can see, here's a histogram of pregnancies. That's 
potentially useful. And you can, so for the most part, these suggestions are, they're, they're just that. They're a place to get started and to look at your data. But if you wanted to use one of those suggestions, you would end up wanting to do some uh, cleanup and editing and probably uh, <coughs> formatting changes and things like that to make it really something usable. All right, I want to show you a couple more kind of cute little things you can do with Google uh, that you can now do with Excel, but you used to not be able to do with Excel, but um, it's, it's kind of easier to do in uh, Google. So I want you to change sheets. You'll note, you'll, uh, down here at the bottom of your sheet, you should see the third one over says city population. So go ahead, go ahead and click that. So what this data shows is just uh, given an urbanized area, it shows its population over uh, five different decades, uh, and that's in thousands. So Atlanta in 1950 had 507,000 residents. So what we're going to do our create is create spark lines, and you do that using an Excel function, actually. Uh, so what I'm going to do is click on G3, which is just uh, the end of the Atlanta line, and I'm going to say equals spark line. And then if you hit the tab key, it will auto complete. And I want you to type in B3 colon F3. And then close the parenthesis. And what that's done is created a tiny little line graph for each of those values in. Uh, just that single row. So what I'll do then is take, uh, if you hover over that and you see that little blue box in the bottom right of your screen, of the, of the box, when it turns to a little crosshair, you see that? <coughs> if you click and drag it down all the way to the bottom to, your last, to the last row of your data, it will copy that function over and create a tiny little spark line for each of the cities in our uh, chart here. So you can see, this is, I mean, it's a quirky, weird little thing, but looking at it, you can quickly see, well, which city skyrocketed in the early 50s and 60s, which ones actually have lost population, uh, which ones have flatlined, uh, that sort of a thing. So you can quickly look and see uh, what's going on there. So you can see, uh, you can find our friends in the Rust Belt pretty easily. Wherever there's been a precipitous drop uh, in population, you see there's Buffalo. Uh, you can see Cleveland actually uh, evened out uh, after the 80s. Uh, Detroit actually didn't lose as much, much, as much population as you might think. That's been more since 1990 that Detroit's gone down. Pittsburgh, et cetera. Um, so, I, uh, so that's spark lines, and that's basically where you have, uh, you can create a tiny little line, time series line chart uh, for uh, your data. We'll do another one over here. It's a little more complicated, so click on the next sheet, which is city change pop, the last sheet uh, in there. For this one, I want you to type in, it's a little longer, so bear with me. So equals spark line tab to complete it. Again, B3 colon E3. So very similar to what we did for the last one. But this, uh, we want to set a couple options. So do a comma, and then we'll put in uh, curly brackets. So that's the, the bracket that looks like whoop, whoop, whoop. Uh, so do a left curly bracket, <coughs> and then I want you to put uh, quotation marks chart type, all one word, all lowercase, another quotation mark, then a comma, then another quotation mark, type in the word column, another quotation mark, then a semicolon. This is verging on programming. This is Google slipping in some uh, uh, programmer syntax type stuff. That's why it's so annoying. Uh, so after the semicolon, put in another quotation mark, and then type in neg color, so N-E-G-C-O-L-O-R, and then 
another quotation mark to finish that, and then a comma, and then quotation mark, the word red, another quotation mark, another uh, curly bracket to close it off, and then a an, an parentheses to close that off, and hit enter, and then same deal, click and drag all the way down. And what that's done is taken each of the values and shown uh, the amount. It's so, it's, so it's similar to that line chart, but what we're seeing now is wherever, um, so you see in our values, I should have said <coughs> before we got into that, this is showing the percentage change in population in each of these urban areas from the previous decade to the next decade. Uh, so what we've done now is wherever there's a negative change in the population, it's colored red. So this makes it even easier to see uh, which urban areas experience decline over given decades. So you can see which ones really boomed, uh, which ones shrank, and you can see just how much the period from 1950 to 1960 saw just an incredible amount of urbanization in the United States. That, that is the one key takeaway, I think, for this particular graphic, is if you look at that big, that first block for almost all of them, is just gro huge growth across the board. And this small one here, I bet that's, okay, Norfolk. Interesting. I was gonna... So the, yeah, it's the start of the baby boom. This is post-war. This is everyone, the post-war people uh, uh, leaving farms and uh, going to college, uh, things like that. But uh, yeah, so this you can see uh, another, this is another kind of a spark line graph, but this time showing growth, decline, uh, all, all on one tidy little line there. So that's just the very quick overview of Google Sheets. That's all I'm going to cover for there. Um, does anyone have any questions before I show you a couple of uh, uh, the interactive uh, visualization tools that are out there? OK. All right, so I want to talk a little bit uh, just about, well, I won't talk about Tableau that much, really, but Tableau is a platform that's out there for creating uh, interactive data visualizations. It's hugely popular. Um, it, it's, it's being used by everybody. As a student, you can get uh, free access to the full deal version. Uh, there's a lot to dig into. There are a ton of learning resources out there. But I just want to look at one example of something you can look at. This is, uh, I'm ostensibly a baseball fan. I used to watch it a lot more before I had kids. Um, <clears throat> but this is showing for every single uh, Major League Baseball team uh, their yearly attendance from 2001 up until uh, the pretty much last season, I think. So you can see, and then the nice thing is so you can mouse over each of these points. So, so this entire thing, which is a very nicely designed graphic, is itself uh, fully interactive. So you can see, uh, my team, the Chicago White Sox, have just nosedived since the year after they won the World Series, which no one other than White Sox fans remembers that they even won the World Series in 2005, ending the longest drought in Major League history, which no one knows uh, anyway. <laughs> no one cares about baseball anyway. But uh, so this is a, a really, so Tableau lets you make these really beautiful things these really cool uh, 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 displays, and um, you can create dashboards and things like that with Tableau where you have enterprise level data, so you can have a continuous data feed coming into Tableau, you can hook it up to a database, and you can look at up to the minute updated statistics reflected in all of your graphs and charts and things like that. So Tableau's, yeah. Yeah, so the, the public version of Tableau, you don't even have to uh, really sign up. Like, you, you can just dive right in and play with it and, and see what's available. But again, as uh, uh, students at least, you can request and get access to the full uh, 
the full version, uh, which is a desktop piece of software, uh, you can get free access to it and do. As long as you're not making money, uh, they'll give it to you, uh, which is most software companies' models. Uh, so that's Tableau, it's very cool. Um, it has a bit of a learning curve to it, that's for sure. Um, coming from Excel, it's, it, it's, you just need, you would have to spend time with it. Honestly, I haven't spent enough time with it to really get a good grasp on it, but uh, there are tons of learning uh, uh, aids out there and, and, and you, can, you could do it, you could do it. Uh, one thing I want to, the last thing I want to talk about is D3.js. So if you are, like me, a programming kind of person, uh, D3 gives you the ability to create uh, just completely customized interactive graphics down to almost the pixel level, uh, which means because you have total control over these visualizations, there's a lot of coding involved and it can be a little tedious to put them together. So it's not something where you can just click and highlight the column and say create a, sc a scatter plot. Uh, that, that doesn't work, but you can create something like, I don't even know, I just click this thing. Koalas to the max, it might not work. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. So this is just kind of a game apparently <laughs> where I'm hovering my mouse over and it's splitting each of these circles into different, into four different ones. That's not too exciting. <laughs> but, but here you can see uh, this is a, a line chart where uh, this is showing uh, unemployment numbers over time for uh, different US uh, uh, metropolitan areas. So here you can hover over the different metros and it'll isolate that one and pop it out. And here, and the, the beauty of D3 is that it's totally open source. So for this particular visualization, you can just scroll down here and this is all of the code that uh, goes into making that exact visualization. So uh, it's very cool. Uh, I'll show you one more. So this is a, a difference chart. So showing uh, the temperature in New York versus San Francisco. Uh, let's see, when New York was warmer, it's orange. Uh, when, uh, when New York was colder, it's blue. So that's kind of cool. So it's where you can, uh, because there are a lot, there are tons of visualizations out there, uh, different chart types that are very, um, very specialized and very, uh, just very special use case. So that uh, for the most part, even a company like Tableau hasn't taken the time to uh, make them something available. That's where you would go to D3 and you could hand code uh, your own version of that. So someone took that, uh, that Minar graphic from uh, 1869 that I showed you and they recreated the whole thing using D3, uh, which is very cool. Uh, so that's all I wanted to talk about. We have one minute left. Uh, I really appreciate everyone coming and I uh, will answer any questions you have at this point. If you wanna talk afterwards, that's fine too. But uh, thanks everyone and we'll share the slides and all that.